So always a good place to start, right, is a definition. What are we talking about when we um, talk about etiquette? Well, if you open the dictionary, um, as a noun, etiquette means rules governing socially acceptable behavior. And I think that is, you know, generally the definition that a lot of us think about. We think about etiquette as this series of rules, right? Something to be learned and, you know, followed and, um, you know, just kind of almost has a little bit of a negative connotation. And that's really not the purpose of the program tonight is just for you to understand rules and be able to put those in place. I mean, there's certain elements of that, right? But we're going to explain some of the reasoning behind things and, you know, kind of why things happen. Um, so I have this, you know, kind of etiquette redefined um, statement that I like that comes from an etiquette consultant. Her name is Callista Gold. And she um, says, it's going to advance here, Jen, to the next. Yep, there we go. Um, so I know it's a little bit long. Bear with me. I'm just going to read through it really uh, as quickly as I can. Um, but I really like um, the perspective that she shares. And it's really how I want to frame our time here tonight. So she says, the biggest misconception about etiquette is that it's designed to make everyone conform and quash individualism, as if etiquette rules were constraints that restrict us from creativity and self-expression. It's quite the opposite. We are a collection of our experiences in life. Those experiences make us uniquely us. Etiquette is a greater awareness of the people around us and a kindness towards people of all different experiences. Etiquette is about being aware of and attentive to the people. The rules of etiquette give us confidence so we can let our personality shine through. So I highlighted in red some really you know, key points that I wanna emphasize, but that's really what we're focused on tonight, right? It's how are we interacting with the people around us, right? How are we aware of what their needs are? How do we show them the utmost in courtesy, right? That's where when those manners really come into play. Um, it also gives us confidence, right? So if we understand what to expect, right, when we go into this dining situation, when we're in that interview meal, and of course, we're going to feel a little bit nervous in that type of a situation, um, or we're in that meeting with our, you know, brand new uh, boss, right, we're going to feel a little bit nervous. And so when we feel comfortable, and we feel confident, and we understand what we're doing, um, then our personality, we're going to be able to relax a little bit more, and that true personality is going to shine through, we're going to be able to build those relationships um, and make connections that are going to be really important in our career. So that's really, um, really what we're about here tonight as we talk about etiquette. So the first thing that we need to do is understand the table setting. So poll question number two, Jen, if, uh, I think it had to do, sorry, it was a little bit out of order, but we changed the slides up a little bit. So um, poll question number two relates to, I think, the fork, right? So what did people say? Yeah, so the question is, um, the forks are placed to the right side of the place setting. And this is a true or false question. And we're actually completely 50-50 split with <laughs> okay. true and false. All right, right down the middle here in terms of people understanding which side do the forks go. Well, you know, honestly, we put that in our marketing, right? Do you know like which, you know, which fork is yours? Which glass is yours? Where do you put it? Because um, these are the kinds of questions that come up, right? Do we really, you know, think about these things, even if we go into a dining? So the actual, you know, answer um, is that those forks are to the left. Um, so the half of you, right? You had it right. Um, and half of you were, were, that's why we're here tonight. We're here to learn, right? So that's good. Um, so let's talk about this place setting a little bit. Um, I always like to imagine that the place setting is kind of, um, you know, draw a line down the middle of that place setting. And if you're looking at this um, graphic, it's really helpful. So we have the forks to the left and over there on the right, we have spoons and knives, right? This is a really formal setting. Um, my setting here is kind of an in-between setting um, that I have on the table. Um, a good um, little hint, I guess, uh, that I like to give is that uh, when you're questioning the forks and the spoons and the knives and where they go, is to remember that the word left has four letters, right? L-E-F-T. And the word fork also has four letters, um, F-O-R-K. So those forks, right, that fork is on the left, okay? And then over there to the right, the word right has five letters. And ironically, the word spoon and the word knife also both have five letters and they go to the right. So that's just one of those little devices that make it easy to remember um, what goes where. So that forks are to the left or to the right. Another hint that you wanna keep in mind um, as it comes to um, silverware and what you use for different courses is that 
they're generally set to work your way from the outside in towards that dinner plate, okay? So your first courses, if when in doubt, you're not sure, you're presented with all of this silverware and you don't know what's what, it's gonna go from the outside and work your way in, right? So you're gonna have, in my case, in my setting, I've got that salad fork to my left and then the dinner fork closest to my plate. We're gonna work uh, with that soup spoon all the way to the far right. Now that soup spoon sometimes looks a little different, both mine and the one on the screen are shaped a little different. Might be larger, might be rounder, um, and it's gonna to be to the far right. Um, they don't have in this picture, um, but in my place setting, I have a teaspoon, right? So this is a beverage spoon or a teaspoon that's gonna be set next. I have two knives, there's three there. Again, just depending on how formal and how many courses that you're gonna have, that's how much silverware you're gonna have. So you're always gonna have a sense of what's coming, right? Based on how much silverware you have. So that out, outermost fork in a, in a basic setting is gonna be the salad fork and then the dinner fork, right? There might be things like a fish fork, fish knives, uh, things like that as well, okay? Then we have um, an extra piece of silverware up there on um, the bread plate and that is the bread knife. Um, our silverware for dessert is set above the place setting, um, typically, um, and so that tells you a little bit about that. Another little hint that I always like to give is uh, the A-OK -okay sign, right? Um, and so that looks something like this. So if you do the A-OK, -okay, or remember the etiquette is A-OK, -okay, if you look on your left hand, that looks like a B, right? So B is going to stand for bread in this case, and so my bread plate is to my left. If I look at my right hand, it's a D, and so that stands for drink. So my drinks are all to the right. So I have my water glass, or perhaps it's wine glass, um, and then we have our you know, coffee service over here. So that's D for drink. So that's to my right and bread to the left. And so that's how we kind of can remember um, what, uh, what goes where in that table setting. That could be other things on the table. There were in that graphic, you saw some salt and pepper shakers. Um, there might be a bread bowl on the table, uh, dressings on the table, shared butter on the table. There could be lots of other things um, that help, you know, help that meal. Okay. But your basic, what we've talked about right now, your basic table setting is right here. Okay. And we don't want to move things throughout the place setting, right? I've had that question before. So I'm, you know, say I'm left-handed. So my beverage here is on the right. Can I move it to my left? No, sorry, we can't because that, especially if you're at a group table, that is going to, um, you know, potentially confuse your server, right? Things are in place for a reason. Um, it might confuse the person sitting next to you, right? And next thing you know, they might be taking their drink and drinking out of it instead of their own um, because they're expecting it to be on the right. So once things are in the place setting, they do have a purpose um, and we need to, you know, kind of leave them uh, where they are, okay? All right. And so, you know, why is it important to understand the place setting? Our next graphic here um, shows you that a table can get quite complicated, right? Which class is mine again? Um, so remember that a etiquette is A-OK. -okay. Um, this is a very formal setting, right, with four forks and, I don't know, maybe like six or eight pieces of stemware. Um, you may not encounter something like this too often in life, uh, but it can be confusing, especially at a round table. Um, maybe, maybe it didn't look quite like this, but you've probably been at a banquet or a wedding or something where it was difficult to figure out, you know, what fork was yours and what drink and what bread plate uh, belonged to you because the table got so crowded. So now you'll know. All right. So now we're gonna move into um, the actual meal. Now that we understand the place setting and know where things are and what belongs to us, there's some things that we wanna cover related to the meal itself. Um, one just general rule of thumb that I like to put out there um, to begin with is that when in doubt, we can follow the host. And if there is no host, we can be the host, right? So following the host. So if someone has invited you to dine, you know, you're, you're at something where there is kind of a lead person. That person can give you some clues, you know, throughout the evening um, related to, um, you know, when the meal might be beginning, things to order. We're going to talk about ordering later. You know, so you can always use your host as kind of a guide, right, into how the meal might flow. Now, there's going to be other situations, right? That conference, you're going to a speaker, you know, and there's a dinner. Um, you're at a group table with 10 kind of randomly assigned people. Um, there's really no host in that instance at the table. And so we're, what I'm hoping is that because you've come to tonight's program and you've learned some tips and uh, strategies that you're going to take on kind of that host mentality, right? So when we talk about when to pass things and, you know, that you're going to take initiative. Um, you're going to understand, you're going to make conversation and really, you know, engage with people um, at that event and kind of, have, you know, be the host, take on that type of a, an approach. 
Um, so first thing we want to talk about is arriving at the table. So when we arrive at the table, um, you know, in terms of it kind of this kind of ties into that start of the meal as well. Um, we're going to want to greet people we want to say hello, we want to have kind of a self introduction, you know, ready, we might be arriving at the table, we might be arriving and meeting someone perhaps maybe in the lobby if we're eating at a restaurant and then, you know, going to the table together with that, that person. So make sure you know where you are meeting someone, first of all, kind of set that in advance. Um, and then you're going to have to say hello, have that self-introduction. And this is where that handshake comes into play, because that handshake is kind of that universal greeting. And so we did have a poll question um, on handshakes, because we want to have a good handshake. You want to practice your handshake ahead of time, um, find someone you really, you know, trust their opinion, shake their hand and ask for feedback, right? Because oftentimes we really don't, we don't know what it's like to shake, you know, our own hand, right? There's just no way to do that. Um, so what did the group say in terms of what they thought was kind of the worst handshake, right? And there's lots out there. I've kind of named them funny names, but these are ones I hear about every time I do this presentation um, live and in person. Uh, these are, are some of the most common ones that come up that, that my um, attendees mention. So Jen, what was the uh, kind of the feeling of the group? So 50% of um, our audience said the bone crusher. 33% um, said the never ending handshake and one um, person, so that's 17% said the clammy Sammy. Uh, all right, so definitely, you know, you're out there, you're, you're uh, answering this um, question. It seemed like bone crusher was one that was really top to the list for most of, the, of you out there today. Um, and certainly, you know, all of these probably have some kind of negative impression, right? So all of you had an impression, you were able to say, oh, you know, I just don't like that kind of handshake. So you wanna make sure you don't have that kind of a handshake um, because it does form an impression. So some of you, maybe, you know, why you don't like the bone crusher? Well, number one, it inflicts pain, right? Like none of us are gonna like that. Um, but other people will say, you know, hey, it seems kind of overly aggressive, right? We might start to form an impression about that person. It might not be true, right? But, but that's just what happens, right? We start to form that impression. Um, when someone had, um, you know, the never-ending handshake, that can just be kind of, you know, annoying, right? You know, so it just doesn't end, it feels awkward, right? And again, that's not the type of first impression that we want to leave. So again, be aware of these things, be aware that they do make impressions, practice your handshake, it is an important part of the greeting um, and arriving at the table. Now that can be tricky, right? So if you're meeting someone in the lobby one-on-one, -on -one, it's pretty easy to, you know, extend that hand, you know, in the thumbs up position is what I always say, right? You fully grip the other person's hand. Um, the webbing of your hand should meet the webbing of the other person's hand and completely, it's hard to do this, but, you know, um, completely grasp the other person, a few shakes of the hand and then release, right? So it's, it's pretty simple, uh, but we want to smile, we want eye contact, and that's not too difficult when we're, you know, standing up, arriving in a lobby and meeting someone. Now at a table, it gets a little bit you know, more tricky. Um, it really just depends on how easy it is, you know, if someone's already seated, whether or not they're going to stand up to shake your hand, you know, when you arrive at the table, you know, you could approach them and extend your hand. Um, if it's too difficult, if there's too many people that have already arrived and are already sitting, you know, you might just say hello and kind of nod, you know, the head, nice to meet you, introduce yourself. Um, a handshake may not be appropriate in that situation, just depending on how challenging it might be. Um, for people to stand up and to greet you. So um, just something to keep in mind. So when does the meal actually begin, right? Um, so the official start of the meal, one of the things that you want to keep in mind is that the meal really shouldn't, you know, we shouldn't signal the beginning of the meal until everyone has arrived, right? So if you're waiting for someone, you've sat down already, someone's maybe arriving a little bit late, you want to wait for that person to join in the meal before beginning. Um, same thing at a program or an event, you know, if you're the first person to arrive, um, you know, wait till others have um, joined at the table or the program's about to begin, or again, when in doubt, we can follow the host. How do we, you know, indicate that the meal is actually going to begin? Well, the official begin in the beginning of the meal, right, really, you know, starts again when everyone's arrived or when the program's about to start, and we signal that by putting the napkin on our lap. That is when it begins. So you shouldn't arrive to the table and put it on the nap, you know, on your lap before it arrives. Now, I apologize. I just moved to this house <laughs> about, um, actually today, two months ago. You think I'd be further along than I am, but I'm not. So my cloth napkins are 
I don't know, packed in a box in the basement. So uh, I have a dish towel, my apologies. But your napkin is going to be, you know, folded at the center or to the left of your place setting, right? It's generally gonna unfold to either a, a rectangle or the base of the fold will be a triangle, right? So we wouldn't do this. We certainly wouldn't hold up the napkin, but we're gonna unfold it gently. We're gonna put it in our lap. We're gonna keep it folded in half once, okay? With that fold towards us, we're gonna put that in our lap. And if it's a triangle, that's fine as well, okay? What we don't do is unfold the entire thing and put it on our lap like a table, okay? So we have that in our lap. We use the napkin throughout the meal to gently blot at our mouth, okay? If we need to leave the table for a reason, right? Maybe um, I have to step aside to take an important phone call. Perhaps I need to excuse myself to the restroom. We can put that to the left of our place setting. It doesn't have to be folded back up or we can place it on the seat of our chair when we get up, okay? When we're finished with the meal, we're leaving all together. I know we're not anywhere near the end of the meal yet, but when we are, we would place that to the right of our place setting, okay? So left means I'm coming back, right means I'm finished, okay? Um, or on the seat means that I'm coming back. We would never drape the napkin um, over the back of our chair. Um, that's not a way like we're trying to save seats or whatnot. Just put your purse or put you know something, a program, something on the table or on your seat, but don't, um, don't drape the napkin over the chair, okay? So that's a little bit about napkin use. Um, next, we're gonna uh, talk about, um, you know, a few of the other, you know, things like beverages and passing things, just the stuff that kind of happens that we need to know prior to actually eating uh, the meal. So a couple points about beverages. Remember, beverages are, if we're doing a-okay, those drinks are gonna be to my right. Um, you know, if you have a water glass uh, or something, iced tea, perhaps, um, there might be lemon, you know, on the, on the side of that, or lemon might be served on a plate. Um, it doesn't have to stay on the, on the glass. We're going to drink it, right? That should be removed or it should be put into the water. If you want to squeeze the lemon, make sure you cup your hand around the lemon, squeeze it gently, and then put it in. We don't want that to kind of squirt <laughs> um, in someone else's uh, direction, right? If you like sweetener, right, a sugar or anything like that, um, ask the person closest to it to pass it, kindly pass it towards you. Um, but remember moderation. When it comes to etiquette, everything in moderation. So we would use, you know, one or two packets of sugar or a teaspoon of sugar, put it in there, stir it gently with our um, beverage spoon. Just, you don't, you know, it's always something with etiquette in terms of manners. You don't want to call unnecessary attention to yourself. In other words, um, the fact that you put seven packs of sugar, you know, and you're meeting someone for the first time, that probably is going to be one of the things they remember about you rather than, you know, the great conversation that they had. I mean, I hope they remember that too, um, but we don't want those kinds of things to be, you know, the things that stand out or really catch someone's attention, right? So we want to keep things in moderation, um, you know, completely, you know, so well put together that no one even notices, right? So we're going to uh, use that. Sugar. When you are opening a packet of sugar, brought a packet of sugar in here, you would just tear that about three quarters of the way uh, uh, open, put it, put it in, fold it up. You can put it under your, if you have a saucer, this is great. Um, at, you're not going to have that maybe in a restaurant situation, but you're going to have it if you're at like a, a social where it's like a banquet or a, a conference, you know, type setting. Um, because that will not move throughout the meal. And so it's a great way to kind of have all those like paper and kind of the trash kind of keep it uh, under wraps. Okay. Another thing is that typically with coffee service, so I have my coffee mug over here, typically that's going to come out with um, dinner, right? That's about the soonest that you'll typically see it being served. Um, and that's appropriate if they're not bringing coffee service, you certainly can ask at dinner, that would be appropriate. It most definitely will be brought with dessert at the very least, okay? Um, so that's just something to keep in mind as well. All right, so that was a few things about beverages. Um, in terms of passing things, um, we uh, have several things on the table to pass. One of those would be our um, bread and butter, because that's going to happen right as the meal is beginning. So it's appropriate to pass the bread with like a soup course, with a salad course, whatever that first course is, we would get the rolls um, or the bread um, pass. We also might have to pass the butter um, along with the bread service. So it would go right after um, the bread. 
uh, perhaps with our salad, there might be salad dressings that are shared that need passed, right? So we have all of these things to pass. And if we're eating family style, right? If that's kind of a family style service, um, certainly we're going to be passing um, things around the table as well. So poll number three um, asked about passing. So Jen, what do people think about which direction to pass? Okay, so this was another question that was right or left, and we are completely split 50-50. All right, 50-50 again. All right, so this is a little bit of a tricky question, actually. So um, technically speaking, things are passed to the right, okay? But those of you who said left, I'll tell you why you might be thinking left or where, you know, where that's kind of crept into the back of your mind down for some reason. So the most formal way to pass, and again, this is not an official bread basket, but it's making do for tonight. Um, the person closest to the bread or the item that needs to be passed, again, remember, you're going to be the host and there's not a host. So you're going to look and if you're closest to something, um, you know, certainly don't go across the table for that, but be aware that when you're closest to something, you would start passing that um, bread at the beginning of the meal. You would pick up that item. The most formal way of passing is that you're going to offer to the person seated to your left. Okay, so this is where I'm saying you're probably hearing the idea of left coming to play. So if there was like a napkin or something in here and the rolls were in this um, uh, basket, I would turn to the person on my left and I would say, would you like a roll? So I would ask them that. They would take a roll. I wouldn't give the basket to them, but I, they would take the roll. I would then serve myself the roll, put it on my bread plate, and I would pass to the person on my right. Okay, so it's offer to the left, serve yourself, pass to the right. Now, if you're not wanting to do that most formal of service, maybe someone, maybe there's a gap in seating at a round table, there's no one to your left. Um, what you want to keep in mind is that, uh, you know, good manners would indicate that you don't serve yourself first, right? So remember back that definition when I talked about, it's all about thinking about the other person and really be attentive to their needs. So again, with kind of the quote unquote rules of etiquette is that we don't take an item off the table and serve ourselves first. That's why we offer it, then serve ourselves. So if you don't want to offer or can't offer, you would simply pick up the item and you would pass it to your right. When it goes all the way around this table, you would serve yourself last. Okay, so that's sort of the meaning or the, the reasoning behind that. Again, now once we're passing this roll, we put it on our plate and we pass that. Again, the, the butter, if there's butter, even if you don't like butter, again, have to remember, it's not all about you. <laughs> um, it's about the whole dining situation. So we're gonna be aware that other people may want the butter. So if we pass the bread, then we're gonna get that butter going as well. Um, there's gonna be different kinds of butter. If it's a shared butter, like um, not like a packet of butter, or if it's a packet of butter, obviously you would put that on your bread plate. If it's shared butter, you would use your uh, bread or butter knife and you would take a portion of that butter and put it on your plate. Okay, don't butter directly onto your roll right as you get it. So just take that portion of butter, put it on your bread plate, or if you don't have a bread plate on the side of your dinner plate, and then pass that. That's become kind of a thing. Um, nowadays, I've dined lots of places, either at you know, conferences or even restaurants that have kind of a, a bread service. Um, so it's bread, maybe there's a variety of rolls or breads, and then there might be a variety of butters or other toppings um, like chutneys, things like that, that go with the bread. Does that make sense? So it is shared um, and make sure that you're aware too of how many people you're dining with, right? You know, be appropriate in how much you take. Don't take all of, you know, something that is shared, right? Take just a small portion so that everyone can have it. Um, same with um, the dressing. So if we had multiple dressings, um, we're gonna pretend this creamer is like a dressing um, for right now. If we had multiple dressings, we would pass both of them, right? Because we don't know who wants, you know, which dressing and don't try to figure that out. Just if it's closest to you, pass both of them. People will take what they need and pass on the rest, okay? Again, keeping in mind that we're not the only person with the dressing. So don't like hog all the dressing basically, right? Or any item that's shared on the table. So we're going to get all of those things passed um, and that's going to allow us to begin the meal. Now, when everyone has been served, then it's appropriate to, um, you know, begin with that particular course. So if we are going to have um, a soup course, you know, that would be our first course. If we weren't having soup, then we would start with salad. So we do need to talk about silverware, right? So if we're going to get into our courses of soup and salad, we need to know how to eat, right? How to use our silverware. So I'm going to talk about that, and then I will ask if there's any questions after we talk about silverware um, thus far. All right, so 
a couple different things that I want to mention with silverware. It's first of all, we have to know how to hold our silverware properly, right? And so these two little diagrams are, um, you know, give you some idea of the proper way to hold it. So if you look at um, that fork and knife, we hold the knife um, when we're cutting food in our dominant hand and the fork in the non-dominant hand. Okay, so in my case, I'm right-handed, so my knife is in my right hand and my fork in my left. It's times down, we secure the food, and we cut one or two bites of food, and that's it at a time, right? So we don't cut up the entire chicken breast, we don't cut up the entire salad, only a bite or two at a time, okay? And so we hold that knife and then we fork, and you can see that the handles are kind of in the palms or under the palms, and we use the index finger to kind of guide uh, or direct that knife and fork. You can see under improper, what really makes that improper is that I can see the handle of the fork, right? Um, so anytime we can see the handle, we, you know, it's kind of that, I would say it's like the caveman approach, right? It looks like we're stabbing our food and, um, you know, sawing at it and we don't want to look like that, okay? So that would be improper. And then there's two different styles of dining, right? So once we know how to hold the silverware correctly, then there's two styles, American style and continental style. Either is appropriate. They both start exactly holding a knife and fork like I just said, okay? Um, the American style is um, more of what I call kind of the switcheroo <laughs> um, approach, um, which we'll talk about in a minute. And the continental is a little more straightforward and uh, simple and there is no switching of hands, okay? So let me just demonstrate. So we're holding that, that knife and the fork here. I have my salad plate and my salad, you know, has arrived. You want to keep a couple things in mind um, as you're cutting your food is be aware of your posture. So you can lean, you know, in towards your plate a little bit, right? Sit up straight. Um, as someone in your life probably has told you at one time, right? Sit up straight at the table is probably advice you've heard. Um, so that is important. You want to be able to make eye contact with someone, have a good conversation. That's what's most important when we're dining with other people. Um, we want to make sure we're not kind of hunching over our food, right? And you'll, if you observe now after you attend this and you'll be, you know, observing other people, um, people sometimes look like they're protecting their meal, right? <laughs> so like they're kind of hunched over, right? And they're cutting like this, right? We don't want to do that again, sit up straight, um, relax the shoulders. Um, don't, you know, again, not that kind of hunched up approach. We don't want to also angle up our hands so much like this when we're cutting. It doesn't look as good, right? So we're relaxed, we spear that food, we cut that bite. Yeah, really simple. In the American style, what's going to happen next? We cut that one piece of food, we set the knife down, blade towards us, the fork switches to the dominant hand, and it, it moves to a times up position. We take that bite or two of food and chew it, and then we switch it back, right? Those times down, we pick up the knife, cut another piece or two. So there's a lot of kind of back and forth, right? So we're talking, but we're moving that back and forth to be able to cut and it goes to the dominant hand, okay? So I'm hoping that makes sense. In the continental style, or sometimes called the European style, we're gonna start the same. We're gonna cut that piece of food, one piece at a time generally. We're gonna spear the food, it stays times down and it comes to the mouth times down in the non-dominant hand, okay? All food is on the back of the fork, it never flips, right? So if we have mashed potatoes, if we have rice, whatever, it's you use the knife to move the food to the back of the fork and then eat it that way. So it's not eaten kind of in that scooping method, and it is in that non-dominant hand. Either are appropriate, so practice both or, you know, whatever you're comfortable with uh, makes sense. This is more efficient, right? It's definitely a more efficient style, that continental or European, okay? Um, but either works. So if we're doing American, we put it down, we switch it, take, you know, a bite or two of food, and it goes back, all right? So that's the two styles. Now, once we've, you know, eaten that food, um, or perhaps we're only partway through our meal and we need to, again, maybe we need to excuse ourselves for a reason and where it's called like kind of, or we're just taking a little bit of a break. Maybe a speaker started to speak and we're pausing, you know, not to eat. In American style, we have a rest position and a continental style. I think we have graphics on this, but, but the American is the knife on the plate and then it's a times up position with that fork. Um, Jen, do we have, I think we have a graphic slide that shows these rest positions. There we go, resting position American, right? So that knife is on the plate, blade voicing in, tines are up on the fork. And you can see on the continental style, it is something uh, like this where the tines are down on that fork, it's a little hard to see on that graphic. And they just really, you know, you're kind of putting them right where you would need to have them to, you know, take another bite of food, right? They're kind of naturally in the positions uh, that make some sense. And that means you're coming back, okay? And then when you're finished with that particular course, we have a finished position. 
And that in the American style, basically the knife and the fork come together. It is tying down. If you, in this case, you can see on the plate that the handles kind of go off to the right hand side. Um, and the, um, it usually, this isn't like a 10, if you're thinking of a clock face, like an old fashioned clock, <laughs> um, it's a 10, four. Um, sometimes I'll see it in a nine to three as well. Again, with those handles off to the right hand side, either is fine. In continental, those tines are up on the fork and it's typically down on the bottom or again, slightly to the right in that 10 to four, right? Or in the new the six kind of position, okay? And the reason for this, number one, it signals to your server that you're finished, right? Because we have the silverware together, but it is helping the server clear that particular place setting because that's what's gonna happen. We're gonna be between courses. We finished our salad. They need to clear that before they bring the dinner course in. And um, the positioning of the silverware helps them clear. The server in, um, in a group kind of setting, unless you're at a booth or something in a, in a dining hall, but if they're at a table and they have access to all sides of you, they will typically serve from your left side, right? So if I had um, a, a server, they're gonna, they're gonna bring food from this side, right? From my left, it's gonna, I'm gonna place it down this way. They're gonna clear from my right. So they're gonna come in this way and they're gonna clear my food. And that just keeps things organized at the table. And so having those silverware together, um, or possibly slightly to the right, which is, I think, kind of the better position, it allows them to clear better, right? They can secure that, but not as likely to um, drop the silverware on you or on the floor or the table, right? So there is a reason it's like that. All right. So that's the finished position. Good. So now we know um, some of those basics, how to pass, which way to pass, how to approach the table, when to begin, how to use our silverware. Right. All right, so now we're going to move into um, the various courses, just some tips and you know techniques for leaders. So the soup course um, is typically one of the early courses if we're going to have a soup course as in a four course. There are fancier meals than that. There could be seven courses, right? You've heard of things like that, but I'd say most often we're going to be doing a three course or a four course meal. So um, start there. So there is a poll question related to the soup course. So the question is, what is the appropriate way to cool down hot soup? Um, nobody said blow on it gently. Two people, so 33% said stir it gently. Um, nobody said add ice to it. 33% said wait patiently, and 33% said both B and D. So we're pretty split on these three. Yeah, yeah, but you guys are all right on target. So I like, um, you know, one of the tricky things about soup, of course, and why we put this question in there, is that it's a hot, you know, hot, right? And that makes it challenging. It's also challenging because there's sometimes, you know, it's liquid, but there's solid things floating in it, right? Uh, making it uh, tricky or there's cheese or there's noodles, right? So it is a really difficult, you know, sometimes a challenging or difficult course. So if this was our soup um, here and we we're trying to, it's really hot and it's steamy and we're trying to get it to cool, um, you guys were right on track. Those who said to wait patiently, those who said to gently stir it, right? Or to do both, you're right on track, that's appropriate. We're not going to add ice. We're not going to blow on it, right? Even though I have you know, three children of my own and I'm sure I have given them the advice to blow on their soup because that's too hot, right? And we jump in with that advice, right? Even I do it. Um, but yeah, we're going to, we're in this formal situation. We're not at home. And so we're going to gently stir it, kind of release the steam a little bit. Um, and we can wait uh, patiently until it looks like it's approachable. Now, if we eat soup correctly, um, it's not going to be as much of an issue, right? So let's talk about that. If we have this very hot soup. What we're going to do is we take the spoon. It's kind of sideways, right? We use the side of the bowl of the spoon and we scoop away from ourselves just on the surface, right? So we don't go down deep into that soup bowl where it's really, really hot. We just at the surface, that's where it's going to be cool. It's going to come across, go away from yourself. Again, because soup is messy, it's liquid. What we don't want to do is splash the soup on our nice clothes. So we're going to go away from ourselves, pause, let it drip, and then we sip the soup from the side of the bowl, okay? From the side, you know, kind of, it's not like that airplane uh, kind of trick. So we're going to go right from the side, okay? And that's where it's going to be cooler. Hopefully, you're not going to have um, an issue. Be careful not to slurp, you know, too much. If it is hot, pause as best you can. Maybe take a sip of water, <laughs> uh, wait for it to cool a little bit more, okay? 
I also get questions sometimes about soup related to bread and crackers, right? So if it is served with croutons in it, tortilla strips in it, right? Again, could be challenging to eat, but that it's served that way and that is totally fine. If there are crackers or bread, you know, separate, um, one thing to keep in mind is not to, you know, crush your crackers into your soup, not to dunk your crackers and or bread into your soup. Um, someone wants to ask me, can I take the bread and like kind of sop up the remnants of the soup that are on the bottom that I can no longer eat? The answer is no um, in that case, okay? So even if it's the best soup you've ever had in your life and there's a little bit of soup down there, um, you know, you don't want to go to heroic lengths to do it, right? Never drink out of the soup cup unless it is a cream soup and there's no spoon. There are some soups that are special bowls that you can do that, but that's going to be pretty rare. Um, so, you know, keep in mind, you might be able to tilt it slightly to, you know, get that last bite of soup, but we're not going to use the bread or the crackers to do so, okay? Again, and I'm all for uh, a great, you know, tomato soup with crackers in it or um, a chicken noodle soup with crackers, but in this case, we're going to eat those separately. And last, I guess the exception would also be if it's a soup cracker, right? You've seen those little round, like sometimes they're called oyster crackers um, for like a clam chowder. Um, if they serve a soup cracker, those crackers, in fact, can be um, put in the soup, okay? All right, that's soup course. And we're going to have a salad course. So they're going to clear that soup and they're going to bring that salad. Remember, you're going to pass the dressings around. You're going to cut that bite size uh, salad at a time. Do not cut up the entire course. One of the things I like to point out about salads, um, they can be they can be messy again, just like soup. And sometimes we have things kind of fall off the plate. Has that ever happened? There's so much salad on the plate. The plate's not big enough. <laughs> um, it's a little bit of a pet peeve, right? And it makes it really challenging. As soon as you start cutting it, it's just inevitable that things fall off. In this case, we have this kind of charger plate, but oftentimes you won't. Technically speaking, if it falls off your plate, they say you should leave it, um, that it's okay to leave it. That kind of, I don't know, makes me nervous for some reason. So, you know, if you can, when no one's looking, if you wanna, you know, kind of put it on the side of your plate um, or something like that, you're probably okay. I just don't like leaving, you know, a lot of a, of a mess. And that's just something to watch out for and be careful. Um, if you, if there's something you don't like on the salad, let's bring that up. You know, maybe some of you are here, you know, you go to that banquet and there's little tomatoes on it or cucumbers or um, maybe they even serve it with, you know, pecans on it. There's something on it that you don't like. Just really, you know, don't call attention to it. You would never mention that you don't like something that's served to you um, and you, you know, don't move it or, you know, sometimes you'll see people move that item to their bread plate. Okay, something that they don't like, don't do that. Um, simply work around it, right? Kind of push it to the side, don't call attention to it, eat the things that you like. Now, an exception to this would be if you are allergic to something, right? Say those pecans are on there. Um, you weren't expecting pecans on the salad, um, maybe didn't indicate a nut allergy, you know, hopefully they'd be asking those things. I think most places are aware, um, but maybe even ordered something and just weren't aware um, of that ingredient. Certainly in that case, it's okay to clarify or ask questions of your server and certainly to ask for a different salad if you need something prepared differently. And, and you know, in, in those cases, you know, always speak up, um, just do it in the politest way possible and work with your server um, and they'll help you. And that's also, you know, a point to kind of make um, is that your server is there to really help you with this meal and they are there to answer questions, right? So if you aren't sure how something's prepared and you do have some concerns, you know, make sure you're asking those questions um, of your server. It's completely appropriate. Okay. All right, so that's that salad course. And one thing I like to, to mention as we're transitioning um, between courses, um, well, I'm, now I'm not sure if it's related to poll five or not. Jen, can you remind me before I start talking too much? <laughs> um, the the poll five question. Um, it's okay to begin eating if only one person at the table has not been served and this is true or false or it depends. Okay, great. Yes, I do want that question. I didn't want to speak too much ahead of, of that. So what do people say? So 100% said false. Okay, great. You are right on track. It is false. Um, so you don't need me at all. Um, we do want to wait until everyone has been served. So even if there's just one person that doesn't have their food, um, as we're moving you know, through these courses, it's most polite and good manners to wait until everyone's been served. Now, the one exception to this would be if that person, like the person themselves who has not been served, if they would say to the table, please, you know, go ahead and dine, you know, taking longer with my food, or, you know, I'm sure it'll be here in a moment, something like that. If they give you permission 
then you can begin. Now that's a judgment call, right? Um, and I would say, you know, it is certainly polite to wait um, for that person, but there could be circumstances, right? Everything is, you know, not necessarily black and white, it's a little bit of gray, um, is if that person, you know, maybe you're on a timeline, right? Maybe um, it is kind of a presentation and you have another thing to, to get to, right? And so time might be of the essence, right? In those cases, maybe you would um, go ahead and dine or you've been waiting a long time for your meal already. There could be lots of reasons for that. Um, but really, if the person doesn't give you that permission or doesn't say that, um, and that could be very polite, right? If that happens to you, um, and you notice everyone waiting for you, um, that, that you could offer that, right? So keep that in mind. When to... All right, so when, um, so when we're you know, thinking about you know, that course and that main course coming out, a couple things that we wanna keep in mind. So right now my salad has gone into the dinner plate. When they set the plate down, um, it's something to keep in mind that you're that you wanna position the plate so that you can easily cut to that main part. And they may set it perfectly down. They should be aware, the server, of how they're setting it to you. But if they're not, um, you know, it's okay to kind of move, you know, the plate one time, right? To get it positioned the way you want. Don't, um, don't drive, you know, your plate throughout the meal. Like I'm gonna eat my main course, I'm gonna move it and eat, you know, don't keep doing that. But one time to set it how it's convenient for you is, is perfectly fine, okay? So we've got that. With the main course, or really with any course, but I like to mention this here, is that we might um, be thinking about seasoning, right? So I have, sorry, two salt shakers here. Um, so I have like a, a pepper grinder. So I have salt in two different locations. So I apologize, I don't have a traditional salt and pepper shaker. But a couple of things to keep in mind with seasoning our food. First of all, we wanna taste our food first, okay? It's considered an insult to the person preparing the meal if you, season your food without tasting it, right? And some people are real sticklers. If they see someone do this, like it really bothers them. Um, and so we wanna make sure that we taste the food, see if it's to our liking. If there is salt or pepper that we would ask the person again, closest to it to please pass the salt and pepper to us. Um, if someone, if you are, if someone requests of you to pass the salt, something to keep in mind is that we always pass the salt and pepper together, right? So even if the other person said, please pass the salt, you would actually pass them the salt and pepper. And you might be wondering, well, that seems kind of strange. They only asked for the salt. Why in the world would I pass them both? Um, it really is so that it makes it more convenient for the next person asking. So if we have this table, maybe there were eight people sitting here at the dining room table and the person way over there, you know, says, uh, please pass the salt. Um, I would pass them both because it keeps them together. So the next person who needs to ask, you know, now I don't have the salt here and the pepper's over there and they have to ask two different people to pass it, right? So always see them as a set, no matter what someone asks you, they go together, um, never to be parted, right? Same point there too. Okay, so that's something about that entree and main course. All right, so then we get to the dessert course. Um, sometimes, depending on the, the situation, if it's a preset kind of meal or a banquet or a conference, you might have your dessert uh, preset, right? And that's to save some time. If it's a very large event, um, then it's going to be up there. Something to keep in mind, if that's the case, is that we need to move our silverware and our plate. So I'm going to pretend here, moving things around, that this is my, you know, we do have a preset dessert. And it's up there. And I have my dessert silverware um, right in front. So when this dinner plate is cleared, we don't eat the dessert up there. Like that's not its permanent position. If that's preset, it's really not where it's supposed to be. Um, it's just there for that convenience and time saving. So we would actually move the plate into our main place setting, right? Just as if they had served it to us um, directly. So if they serve it, it's going to come right here. If it's up here, we're going to move it in here. The only exception to that really, and this has happened a number of times like at Duquesne or you know, other places where there's a speaker or there's a program and they kind of pause or stop service. And so what can happen is that your dinner plate never gets cleared, right? <laughs> so um, you know, you're sitting there, it's dessert, the program's almost over, the meal is ending and someone's speaking and they can't come to clear. You know, in that case, you may have to take a few bites of food, you know, kind of from afar, right? Just be careful <laughs> um, with that. But our silverware too, all of this silverware would be gone, right? If we got up to our dessert course, this would all be gone. And so this is where we move our, in fact, I had that in the wrong direction. I just realized I did that wrong. Spoon is on top. But anyway, so we would move this. You can see that it moves right, you know, into, so if you have to set it, start with your silverware here and then kind of slide it up. And then that way you have them facing the right direction. So 
how you know. So it slides right into and you put it in your place setting and you're ready for your coffee, right? Um, or for your food. A couple things about dessert. The spoon could be an extra spoon for your beverage, or you could be using this spoon. Usually they'll still set both of them. Or it could mean if there's a spoon up here that you have um, a dessert that can be eaten with a spoon. So that would include like an ice cream, a sorbet, um, like a, a pudding, you know, parfait uh, type of a thing. That would be the only food that's eaten with a spoon because there's no dinner spoon. You know, you actually don't eat any other food with a spoon except for those things I just mentioned. So rice, mashed potatoes, corn, those things are all eaten with a fork, okay? If we are eating our dessert with a fork, it becomes our fork and our knife, right? There's very, I can really not think of a dessert that you would need a knife for. Um, we use the side of the fork. So we hold it like this, it's kind of like a pencil. And we use the side of the fork to cut the food. And then we would scoop that up, kinds up with, uh, with the fork. And hopefully that makes sense. I hope you can see that. So we're gonna cut with the side of the fork and we're gonna take a bite of food and like that with the dessert, okay? All right, so that's a little bit about dessert. This also could be, remember, where coffee service comes in. So let's chat about that. Um, could come earlier, right, with the actual meal, but it might come with dessert. Or if you haven't had coffee or didn't want it with your meal, it's fine to ask the server when they're clearing things that you would like coffee. Um, they should ask if you want decaf or regular. You can certainly indicate or ask about that, um, and they would uh, serve the coffee. If you don't want coffee, what you don't want to do is don't turn that cup over. Now, if they do that, they shouldn't, but if they do, um, you know, leave it be. Don't turn it back up or they'll think you want, want some, but don't turn that over. You would simply politely decline. Sometimes you can even, you know, put your hand, like they're coming around with a pot of coffee. Um, you can just say, no, thank you. Just kind of indicate with your hand that you don't want coffee. All right. Um, again, moderation with the sweetener um, and the cream. This is again where you're probably going to have to ask for the creamer and sweetener. I always recommend just like that salt and pepper to kind of pass them together. Uh, because these often get separated and, you know, again, it can be difficult to kind of track it down at a big table. So, um, you know, if you're closest to it again, you want to use it, pass it around um, the table um, for that coffee. Okay. All right. So that was a little bit about the dessert course. Okay. So a couple of things that kind of go beyond, I guess, the actual food and the place settings and all of that. Just like to mention a few things about uh, just a few basic um, table manners, some do's, some don'ts to think about um, during the dining experience. One thing that often comes up this time of year for sure is, um, you know, people have colds, right? They have sniffles or maybe they're coughing. So make sure that you are, you know, coughing away from the table, right? So I always say, you know, cough on the other table. No, I'm joking, but not really. Um, so we cough um, away, cough into our elbow. I think we're all more aware of that now. If you're coughing excessively, this is a time when you to get up and leave the table, right? No one really wants you, you know, coughing, right? If you, um, you know, drink or eat something that kind of makes you cough, that can happen. That can be really kind of intense. Again, we want to try to leave the table. We have to sneeze, again, sneeze away from the table. If you have to then excuse yourself to blow your nose, right? Don't blow your nose. Um, so that's something that comes up. We also don't want to, you know, uh, there's some tricky situations, I guess. So what if we get food stuck in our teeth? You can gently dislodge it with your tongue, like moving that around, you know, kind of thing. Other than that, you, you know, don't do anything else at the table, right? So we don't use the fork to dislodge something. We don't use toothpicks at the table. We certainly don't pick at our teeth with our fingers. Um, all things, again, when you're observing people dining that you probably will, you know, will see people do. Um, in this instance, again, if you really cannot you know, get that out of your teeth yourself, you know, a restroom in a mirror to try to get that out. What if someone else has something in their teeth, something on their face, something on their shirt, right? It could be any number of things. What do we do in that case? Tell the person, do not tell the person. Um, and typically when we're in person, I ask kind of the, the audience this question, you know, um, what do you think? And, you know, a lot of people are hesitant, like, oh, I'm not sure I would tell. And then I ask, you know, if you had something on your face, if you had something like that, you know, would you want people to tell you. Um, and in and most, I really maybe have had like one person in 25 years that I've been doing etiquette dinners um, say that they didn't want to know, right? So it was like, everybody says, yes, please tell me, right? 
So, you know, what I've learned from that is most people want to know. Um, it's kind of how you approach it. Number one, do you know the person, you know, kind of well enough <laughs> um, to feel comfortable? Um, there might be a comfortable, but if it is a stranger, it can be, you know, something that you just, you know, provide that information gently. Don't announce it to the whole table if they're sitting close to you. You know, if it's someone way across the other side, someone else might have to tell them, right? Um, it's just the way it's going to be. Um, but if they're sitting close, if you can do it discreetly and say it in a kind way, they're probably going to appreciate that you mentioned that there's something there, right? Um, you can always try some tactics. People will say that people will mirror you, you know, like you could kind of wipe your face a little bit, you know, a few times, see if they pick up on it. Um, but sometimes that really doesn't work. So um, it may have to be just a little bit more direct, but kind um, about it. Um, if you drop something or spill something, I often get this question too. Um, so that water spills on the table, you know, you knock something over. Um, you know, it happens, right? How many people, probably if I asked, I could see all of your faces and said, how many of you have ever spilled something liquid at the table? I'm sure all of our hands, right, would go up. Maybe sometimes you've done it a couple times in the same meal. How embarrassing, right? It seems like the more nervous we get um, in those situations, sometimes it happens again. Um, and it's okay, right? It happens to everyone. We just want to apologize. We want to clear it up. We want to ask our server for help if we need additional napkins. If you spill it on someone else, of course, you know, apologize sincerely. Um, if it was something that could stain, you could offer to, you know, get that item cleaned for them or follow up with them again. Um, but we, you know, ultimately you have to move on. We apologize and we move on. If we drop something on the floor, we leave it be, right? Unless it is like seems to be in kind of a dangerous location where someone might step on it or, you know, hurt themselves, slip or trip. And we might want to kind of pull it in uh, towards uh, the table or alert our server that it fell and that we need another fork. We don't want to take that dirty silverware and put it back on the place site. And that's something to keep in mind too, is that we keep um, the silverware always, remember the rest position, right? In the finished position, we never take a used piece of silverware and put it back on the table, okay? So it always has a place, <laughs> a home, right? It's going to find its way in a rest and a finish. It's going to be put on the edge of a saucer, on the bread plate, whatever you know you need to do. We don't put the sil dirty silverware back on the, the place site. Another thing I like to mention here is you no know, grooming at the table, right? So, um, you know, women checking a mirror, putting on lipstick. Again, these things are for uh, the restroom. We want to brush our hair, you know, again, use a toothpick, anything like that. Um, if you're in a formal situation, like a, a business meeting, an interview, um, a, a, the banquet or a conference kind of a table, we don't ask for to go food, right? So food to go. So in other words, you know, the food that they presented was too much for you to eat. You ate only part of it. You would not ask for it to go. Now, in a different situation, maybe you are with, you know, you're on that new job and maybe your supervisor took you out for a meal um, or maybe your boss takes you out for a birthday meal or something like that. Um, in that case, because you're just kind of dining a little bit more casually and because food portions are so large and, and people are very aware of food waste and not wanting to waste food and being attentive to that. Um, or if you're dining with colleagues, right? You're new to an office and you're all going out to lunch together. In that case, it's, it's probably okay. Um, so it just kind of depends on the situation. Um, I mentioned um, alcohol here as well. Um, in an interview situation or anytime you're being evaluated for a position, um, we recommend that you don't order alcohol, even if the person, and they shouldn't, right? A recruiter or someone in a hiring role really should not um, be involving alcohol in a recruiting situation. Um, it kind of goes against, um, you know, HR as well as especially our NACE or college, you know, recruiting standards. Um, but, you know, always feel comfortable saying, um, you know, thank you, right? Because in that situation, we always want to be at the top of our game, right? We want to be fully aware. We don't want to be, um, you know, drinking an alcoholic beverage. Now, there could be other times in a professional setting, um, at a reception, at work, um, at a professional conference. And if you're of age um, 21, you might um, have situations where alcohol would be served. Again, always remember that it's a professional situation. Again, we're distinguishing, we're not having pizza with our friend on the couch and we're not hanging out with friends, like having a party either and drinking 
um, you know, that beer, that wine um, in that type of a setting, right? So I always recommend, you know, keeping that, you know, in moderation, um, one or two drinks at the most. Um, sometimes at a conference or something, there might be a free drink included or a ticket for a drink, you know, use that as your guide, right? <laughs> use that ticket. Um, you know, don't be going back up to that cash bar um, too many times and having it be excessive, right? We want to make sure that we're always keeping a professional image at all times. It really can have an impact on our career. Okay, so, so a few um, table manners. If you think of anything else, um, certainly uh, don't hesitate to ask um, questions. I do want to mention um, your server. Um, we don't have a server right here tonight. Typically when we're doing our live etiquette dinners and we have food, um, we have lots of servers, right? Who are really there to help make it. They do a fabulous job, absolutely fabulous. Um, and so they are there to you know, make the meal, you know, go well for you, right? And so you want to use what I call the magic words, right? And as soon as I said the magic words, you probably know what I'm talking about. Please and thank you. Um, I always mention to people that uh, please and thank you. If you went back and asked someone who raised you, um, what were your first words or some of your early words? Um, please and thank you were probably amongst, you know, that short list of your first five to 10 words that you ever learned to speak. Um, and there's a reason for that, right? Um, so we use them early, we use them often um, throughout our lives and certainly with our servers. So we're gonna say, please, we're gonna say thank you, really is the epitome of, of good manners, always treating them with kindness, certainly asking questions and for recommendations. And they're really, you know, it's gonna help you have just a, a better meal when you have that good relationship with your server. And other people observe that as well. Again, if you're in a career or a professional setting um, and you're not kind, right? That's gonna say volumes. Um, about you. So I, I trust that everyone here, you know, certainly would be kind and um, use please and thank you with their server. But that's just something that I like to mention. Um, conversation. Let's go into a couple conversation tips. Um, and then we'll have just a couple additional topics and we'll be wrapping up. All right. So conversation tips. It's not just about eating, right? In fact, when we're in a networking situation, when we're in a, a career or professional meal, it's really not about the food, right? So I often mention that it's not it's not your last meal, um, and so you know we we are really focused on the conversation. You may not eat everything um, on your plate, and that's okay because you might be talking. Um, so a couple of just tips. Um, sometimes this makes uh, folks nervous. As soon as we say networking events or um, you know, we have this dinner and we have alumni there, you know, sure, it makes us, uh, you know, makes a student especially feel a little bit nervous. Um, but here's some conversation tips. So one, one tip is to let the other person speak first, right? So come armed with a good self-introduction, maybe some opening kind of questions, some questions you might ask to, you know, get some information, maybe a comment about whatever the, you know, situation is or the setting that you're in. You could have a few starters but really get that other person to open up a little bit and speak first. Um, and then you can really do kind of the listening, right? Listen attentively, really focus on that person. Maybe you find something in common as they're speaking that you can comment on and then really get the conversation flowing, right? So that's something to keep in mind. We also, on the other side of that though, want to know that too much silence is not golden, right? Um, and so we do wanna be ready with some uh, topics or some uh, open-ended questions to keep the, you know, keep the ball going. So that could be maybe current events, as long as they're not, um, as long as they're positive and not controversial. We can talk shop, which means, you know, talk about something kind of work related or career related. If you're at a work or career related event, um, there's that stay positive, always positive comments. Don't be negative. Don't be a complainer, right? Certainly avoid controversial social topics, politics, religious, um, you know, topics, and um, sometimes even sports, right? Some people are really passionate about their sports. Again, it's staying, you can talk about it, but as long as you're keeping it light and keeping it positive. Um, in my networking workshops, I always call, you know, in interviewing workshops, we talk about making small talk. And I say that it's called small for a reason, right? It's supposed to be about light topics, um, kind of happy, positive things, right? It's, it's small talk, okay? Um, exchanging business cards. So what I mean by this is, you know, you you're going to meet a lot of different people, maybe at that, that event, maybe at that networking reception. And so you can always ask, you know, someone in those career related events for a business card. And that helps you remember who you've met, um, remember their names better, maybe write a little note on the back to remind you about how you might want to follow up. 
Um, and I love this quote by Dale Carnegie, uh, bottom line, you can make more friends in two months by becoming interested in other people than you can in two years by trying to get other people interested in you. And that really takes the pressure off a little bit of our conversation because it's really about focusing on the other, other people you're with, asking good questions, you know, reflecting on that. Um, and they're going to think you're the best conversationalist, you know, that they've ever met um, without you even really having to be the one, you know, carrying the conversation. All right, so that's some tips. Let's move on to um, ordering. Okay, ordering case study. Um, so this is one where, let's make sure we have enough time to do this. It's one of the last things, so I think we'll be good. Um, there will be times when you're in a setting, um, so if you came to a, an actual etiquette dinner, where we would have, you know, Jen and I, right, we would have put our heads together and we would have decided what the menu would be, right? So again, if you're at that banquet at Duquesne or an award ceremony or something, that's going to be a situation where the ordering is going to be done for you. But then you're going to have other situations where you need to order, right? That interview meal or that important, you know, um, meal with a client, okay? Um, or where they're taking you out uh, type of situation. So let's look at this menu. It's the high hold. I live here in Moon. Township and this restaurant is right here, um, not too far from where I live. And it's kind of a fancy, nice place. And here's a little bit of selections from their menu. What I generally ask the group, and we'll see if we can do this through chat since we do have a small group, it may work, um, is to take a look at this menu. If there's something on this menu that you would not order, right? So thinking about ordering, right? Thinking about being in this professional kind of career setting, you're trying to make a good impression. What would you not order and why? As we think about, you're the guest. Remember, you're the guest. They're taking you out, okay? Generally, when I ask this question, it brings up different topics um, that, that I like to address when it comes to tips for ordering. So does anyone have something they'd like to share? And just like type it in the chat. Okay, somebody says the oysters, no spinach in the teeth, exclamation <laughs> point. Uh, very good, very good, I like that. That's perfect, right? Because they are messy and you were reading the ingredients. That is perfect, spinach. We wanna eat something that is not messy, right? That's easy to eat. That Those oysters could probably be a little bit challenging too. And they also have the potential for the spinach to get stuck, right? All good things. And we had somebody else say the oysters because they're too messy. Yep, perfect. Um, and then no onions to keep your breath fresh. Ah, okay, very good. So onions, things that are heavy in garlic. Again, paying attention to those descriptions, you know, those ingredients are really, really important. Um, somebody said the braised lamb is very expensive. Therefore, I think it would be more courteous to pick something cheaper. Right, very good. So good point. It's typically recommended that someone else is, you know, taking us out that we do not pick the most expensive thing on the menu, which in this case, right, if we were looking at this menu, you were right, you know, hitting the mark there because it's $39. Now, there's no particular price point that's wrong or right. It really depends on the restaurant, right? So just really avoiding that most expensive thing on the menu, um, kind of finding something that seems to be pretty representative, right? Because one restaurant, the high hold here is more expensive if you went somewhere more casual um, to eat, you know, uh, dinner, then the price of the points will be lower, right? So it's all kind of relative, but yes, that's a really good point. Anyway, however, um, the exception to this would be following our host's lead. So if the host took us to the high hold, the host said that the braised lamb shank is especially, and they highly recommend it, right? They're giving you an idea of what might be acceptable to you, right? And they're even recommending it. And so in that case, if that's something that you wanted, um, then you could. Okay. And that is also giving you an idea. Yes, Jen. <laughs> Sorry about that. No, go ahead. Um, we do have a question. Is it all right to get something customized since there seems to be nothing on the menu that's vegetarian except for the salad? Yes, yes. And it's probably my, my choosing a few things off the menu. They probably do have a vegetarian option, but it's a very good question. If you're not doing something, um, then yes. I think if you can order something that is as close as possible. Does that make sense? You know, <laughs> um, or 
if you're not seeing that option, and most restaurants would have that, is to ask the server, right? You know, uh, explain uh, what your, you know, dietary needs are. And that I think most restaurants now are very good at working with individuals, you know, on that. So again, if it's a dietary need, if it's things related to allergies, those types of preferences, um, kosher meals, things like that, um, other um, religious, you know, there are other dietary needs, you know, related to religious um indications and not that you have to go into any of those you know, details, but you certainly can work with your server on that. Absolutely. If it's really just a matter of likes and dislikes, does that make sense? Like I just don't like uh, whatever pears or something like that. If it's minimal, order something and ask for that item to be um, left off. If you had to order that high hold artisan greens that I can see here and you say, but please hold the walnuts, the blue cheese and the pears, please. Like if you're deconstructing the whole thing, maybe try to find something else that's closer to your liking in the first place. Okay. So you don't seem too high maintenance. And we had um, some feedback along that topic. Mm -hmm. If you know the restaurant's name in advance, you could always call ahead um, to know what they have. Yeah, that's a very good advice. Thank you. Um, you absolutely can. And many times like this menu, right, again, this was just selections from each section, but I was able to find that right online. A lot of places do have the menu online. You can look at it ahead of time. Um, that is a really good recommendation, bringing that up and or you can ask. But when you're ordering, it is it is really good. You know, it's a good idea to talk to your server, um, to ask for how things might be prepared, to ask about options, you know, and even ask for recommendations as long as you're willing to take recommendations, right? You're open enough to that. Good. Anything else, Jen, that you see that people mentioned? Um, so somebody asks, what if a meal is too big? Can you ask to share? Uh, depends on who you're with. <laughs> Um, and so if you don't know the person well, then no, okay? Um, you're meeting someone for the very first time. It's an interview situation. In those instances, I would not, I would say order your own, you know, portion. If it's a more casual type environment, you might be able to take some of that home. Not if it's, again, if it's an interview or a business meeting, you would not be able to. But in an instance, if you're dining with a colleague, so like Jen, <laughs> you know, right? Uh, we've worked together with a num number of years now, right? And we're going out to eat or something like that. You know, I know Jen really well. It is in a professional environment, you know, but, you know, we have a professional relationship, but it's a longer standing relationship. And so in that instance, I, you know, we'd probably feel com more comfortable. Does that make sense? Like uh, approaching that topic. But you might would I would say you would might want to ask the server to split that for you, um, unless like you're super close <laughs> with the person. Yeah, I hope that hope that answered that question. Um, another thing I like to mention too is we have appetizer salads, main courses, and desserts, right? All listed here. And one thing about ordering that you want to keep in mind too when someone's taking you out is that you really keep that to one or two courses, right? Um, or if something's a la carte, that the things that you're ordering really just add up to what would be a typical main course. Like, you know, it, uh, there's a vegetable, there's a side, there's a meat, you know, that type of thing. Um, so we wouldn't order too many courses, right? Again, unless the host indicates it. So those appetizers and desserts, that's where you're really looking to that host um, to give the, the signal, right? That this is something that you can do. Not that you have to order it if you're full, you know, you can certainly politely decline, um, but really you wouldn't just, you wouldn't initiate, you know, with the server as the guest to say, you know, can I have a dessert menu, right? You would look to the host in that instance. Um, if the host kind of looks to you and this can happen, right? The server comes to the table and says, oh, would you, would you be liking dessert? And that person who's taking you out looks at you and says, would you like dessert, right? Um, that can be a little trickier, right? You know, um, in that instance, you know, you could either just politely decline or you could kind of throw that ball right back at the host, you know, again, gently uh, maybe saying, you know, oh, that, you know, I hadn't thought about that. What do you think? Or, you know, um, let me think about that for a moment and kind of see, you know, what that host might be, um, what they might be deciding. Um, so that's just something to keep in mind that can get a little tricky. 
All right. You mentioned all really good things, right? So just to sum it up, we talked about being avoiding messy, you know, things with too much, um, you know, sauce, difficult to eat, um, ingredients that might stick in our teeth, ingredients that might like garlic and onions be, you know, kind of um, pungent, right, in, in nature, something difficult to eat. I don't know if we mentioned that so much, but I think that chicken, I put it on here specifically because we always think like, oh, chicken, that's safe. That's easy. But if you look at the description, it's a smoked chicken leg bone-in meat of any sort is always more challenging. Um, so I always do recommend something that can be eaten with a knife and a fork, you know, cut easily, um, but be really, you know, cautious, look at the chicken, make sure you know how it's prepared, because um, that could end up becoming difficult. So something challenging to eat, eating things that are with our hands, right, that would be more messy as well. Um, ordering multiple courses, um, look for things, you know, in terms of the expense, right? So those are all some of the things that we mentioned um, about ordering. So great, you did a great job. Thanks for participating and asking those questions. I don't remember what the next slide is. <laughs> um, oh, okay, so we'll pause right here. Did anyone have any other questions before we wrap? I, I don't see any more. Okay, all right, thanks, Jen. Yep. Okay. And so, you know, again, just to kind of finalize, thank you so much to everyone who participated tonight and joined us. Um, we know it's very different from our typical etiquette dinners where we actually enjoy a meal together. Maybe at some point in time, um, some of you will be able to join us when we're able to be back together in a live dining situation. Those are lots of fun and, um, you know, very interactive and you get a great meal. Um, so certainly would invite you back um, to any of our etiquette dinners when they can be in person again. Um, but I do appreciate you kind of joining in um, our virtual etiquette dinner. Um, and I really hope that, you know, as we talked about all the different dining situations that you might encounter in your professional career, that something that you learned tonight, maybe it was something new, maybe it was just a reminder of something that you already, already knew um, and learned at one time, but it's always good to be reminded of something so that you're more aware. I hope that you feel more comfortable, more confident going into your next professional I share this quote from Adriana, who was a participant um, in the past, and she said that, you know, it really did help her um, feel more confident. And I ran into her after one of our etiquette dinners, and she shared with me that she attended a, a networking and dinner event for the National Arthritis Foundation. She felt more comfortable and confident because she um, the previous year. Uh, and I felt that she wouldn't be able to get out without the knowledge that she learned. So that's what my hope is for you. I hope that you're more comfortable and confident at your next event, that you really um, are able to shine through your personality and all of your skills. Thank you for uh, attending tonight. I'd like to leave uh, folks with a quote, uh, one that I like, um, I'm kind of attended that by George Washington Carver, where he says, when you do the common things in life in an uncommon way, you will command the attention of the world. So go out there um, and do your best, exhibit those best manners, and you're gonna command the attention of the world. Thank you everyone for participating um, tonight.